We'll start right away with a song about being scooped, <laughs> which is somebody else publishes your research. And it's a blues song. And I'd like to ask you to be backup singers. I'm at the Labler lab, check out what's on the slab. I'm running gel after gel, makes my life a real hell. I'm a receptor lizard, I'm a ligand wizard. Wrote this great new paper, gonna send it to nature. Went down to the library. This was my postdoc in 19, like 98. There were still libraries back then. Just to check out the journals of February, I've been scooped again. I've been scooped again. I've been scooped again. I've been scooped again. Oh, mama, can't you feel my pain? Heavens help me, I've been scooped again. Now I knew every flagella. Yeah, I knew it real well. I could talk to the cell, cause I speak salmonella. Every many prep. Got my full attention, oh, to publish first, that was my intention. I went down to the library just to check out the journals of September 3. I've been scooped again. I've been scooped again. I've been scooped again. I've been scooped again. Oh, Daddy, can't you hear my pain? <laughs> Heavens help me, I've been scooped again. Thank you for your backup singing. How many people know somebody who's been scooped? <laughs> this is still an issue. Okay, it's like 70%, maybe. It, of course, feels uh, terrible and, and is a kind of maybe makes us change our behavior, like go to a meeting and maybe keep our cards close to our chest, which is no fun because a lot of us came to science to talk about what we do and to learn from other people. So it's one of those fears that can modify the way we behave, maybe in a way that's different from our values or our, our reason for doing science. I don't want to talk about scooping in particular, but more generally, why is it that we don't usually? Uh, talk about the emotional and subjective process of doing science. So, when I was a PhD student, I was very ambitious to succeed. I started doing my PhD in physics, and after about six months, beautiful spring day, looked out the window, and I realized I'm completely stuck. I'm uh, kind of uh, helplessly stuck. Like somebody uh, took the rug under my feet. My basic assumptions stopped working. It was like navigating through, through a fog. And this was quite crushing. Because it found it very hard to get out of bed in the morning, to get dressed. It felt unworthy to cross the threshold of the university because I wasn't like Einstein or Newton or any other scientist I've ever learned about because I never learned that scientists get stuck. Right? So I learned science as a, you have a question, you have an answer. It's a series of steps, logical steps. You make, so it's not that like I didn't have any failures in my life before or difficulties, but this was special. It meant I couldn't be a scientist, which was crushing. And sometimes, somehow I had enough support from my mentor, my family, and I made it through and discovered something new, a little moment of peace where you know you're the only one who knows the secret of nature. Second <laughs> one. And then I started a second project in my PhD, and it happened again. I got stuck, kind of desperately stuck, and then made it through and discovered something. And I started asking other graduate students, do you know this pattern? They said, of course, it's our life. <laughs> Except it's like a secret, nobody tells you about it when you study science or write papers or read textbooks. And, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not, there are not enough principles in the world. There's other fields like education, psychology, and I, I was lucky to do improvisation theater, which is a, a kind of field where there's no no results. You don't know what, you know, you, like you get on stage, you don't know what to do. You, all, all you have is the process. All you have is to learn how to support each other in a difficulty. How, how people can support each other going into the unknown. And I saw that there's a lot of concepts except we don't talk about them in science. It's like, um, another metaphor is when we buy a new microscope, let's say, we get the best optical table, read the manual, the best filters for it to work. But when we bring a new person into our group, how much do we teach ourselves about the conditions needed 
for a person to go into the unknown, you know, in a, in a, in a group of other people kind of groping into a, the unknown. What, we, we don't teach ourselves usually in science. Uh, and that's, that's incredible. Why is that? It's not by chance. It's a, it's, uh, people like Evelyn Fox Keller who look at science say it's a matter of values. Every group of uh, like profession, a group of people has values. And if we move this board here to the middle, I can write down that. And you tell me if you can see it, okay? You in the back there, okay? You can tell me if you see. Uh, we seek in science knowledge that's objective and rational, right? Let's agree, try to, maybe we agree about that. So I'm going to write here, objective and rational. No. Can you see it? Back there? A little bit. The, the myth though, that we have, a, we have a problem in our profession, that we have a myth that doing science that the doing, the way we get this knowledge, is also only objective and rational. As if we're like a robots or Mr. Spock or something like this. But people who have been doing science for a while can recognize that doing some science, in fact, involves everything. So when I write down objective and rational, if science is objective and rational, we automatically stigmatize the subjective and emotional is non-science, or anti-science, or threatening to science. That's why we don't discuss it. But those of you who have been doing science for a while recognize that we do science with everything, with objective, rational, like hypothesis testing, but also subjective and emotional. For example, choosing a problem, right? What am I going to work on? Is an emotional choice, because it's, it comes from emotion, like I'm curious about something, right? Wondering about something. Or maybe I'm annoyed with some dogma, or something like that. It's an emotional, it's like we bring some tuning fork that's very personal, that resonates with nature for some reason, makes us wonder about something, and that's what we bring to the table as an individual human being. So I want to ask you just to start off the conversation to say what you think is essential for being a good scientist, and it's in the subjective and emotional side. Who will be the first? <laughs> To say something. Curiosity. Curiosity. Yeah. Shower me. Yeah? Resilience. Because usually <laughs> experiments don't work. Right? That's, that's our life. What else? Gut feeling. Gut feeling. Yeah. Empathy. Empathy. Because we work with other people. So on this side, objective and rational, there's also it alone. Now, a lot of science is done alone, but you can't do science in isolation. There's other people, especially now with all this collaboration, sir. I have to deal with other people. Empathy, yeah. Passion. Huh? A desire for knowledge. What else? Aesthetics. Aste a sense of aesthetics, right? Like, cause there's an art in, in what we do. Simplicity. To... What else? Huh? Seeing positive and negative. Seeing the positive and negative? Positive and negative. See? Uh, you have so much negative to see the positive in it. <laughs> <laughs> and what else? Ethics. Passion, what? Ethics. Ethics. Huge. Ethics. Madness. What? Madness. Madness. And I, I want to say something like communication too, or collaboration. How many of you took a course on how to collaborate? Yes. You, you, what's the most important principle? Talking. So, a great way to make enemies is to collaborate poorly, or to collaborate without, because for instance, constant communication and, and uh, contracting and understanding is, is essential, and so, uh, so we depend on collaboration, so we don't teach ourselves the basics of it, of communication. It's amazing, no? Look how much resources we spend uh, on, on science. So, um, you know, we can do a lot to uh, add things to our science, our education, conferences, sessions, etc., to talk about issues on the subjective and emotional side. And so, in fact, we successfully completed the first set of three
parts of what I'd like to discuss with you. And that part, we can make, give it a title, Science has a Culture. It has a culture, it has certain values, talks about some things, and doesn't talk about other, the other half, which affects decisions and the way science feels and is and who's in science and who wants to stay in science, etc. The second part is called Culture Can Be Changed. This song <coughs> is about a person who played a very important role in my life. I wouldn't be here giving this talk without him. His name is Mike Surrett. He's a Canadian. When I switched from physics to biology in my postdoc, I, of course, had no idea what, you know, what, what biology, and he was a postdoc in the lab next door, and he was just caring about me, answering every question, no question was stupid, and keeping me from, uh, keeping me in it, basically. So this song is about Mike, and if you have someone like that now, or had, a, you can think, consider thinking about them, and the music is also by Canadian. Leonard Cohen. Mike takes you down <coughs> to a place by the centrifuges. It's your first day in the lab. And you don't know what a centrifuge is And it hands you precious flasks Then you drop them and they shatter And you look at him quite meekly But he says it doesn't matter They were only the controls <laughs> And he gives you of his buffers And he gives you of his trains And you wish you had his genome or at least you had his brains. I came to him one morning, an idea had been forming. My transformers weren't transforming, and my swarmers were not swarming. I said, Mike, I'm a failure. I'm going to work at Happy Burgers. I think I'm quitting science. But he says, now don't be hasty. You see, science like the cafeteria. Sometimes nasty, sometimes tasty. <laughs> and he soothes you so discreetly, and you trust in him completely, and your mind, it has been freed, and you know that somewhere something will succeed. Now Mike is packing his papers in a folder There's a knapsack on his shoulder His pipette is in its holder And as he leaves the floor The shakers all stop shaking The columns all run dry And the odd plate stops baking It'll never be the same And you know that you must keep him or at least that you must clone him And you know that you will miss him And you know that you will phone him all the time <laughs> Mike takes you down <laughs> Do you have someone like Mike? Could you raise your hand? Yeah. Could you name who, who it was? Yeah. John? John, your mentor? Last name? Erickson. John Erickson. And uh, maybe another? Yeah? Beatrice Prado. And who, Beatrice Prado, who was she? What role did she have? Was she, she a, a postdoc? And you are? No, I'm a postdoc. Now you're a postdoc, and she was, you were a graduate student. So it doesn't have to be your mentor, it could be somewhere in a different part of the hierarchy, but I think those, that emotional uh, role is indispensable for many, many of us. So, science has a culture. Culture can be changed. So culture can't help but, ch but change. It changes all the time. And the way that it changes is well studied. It has to do with what people talk about and how they talk about it, and what they don't talk about, and how they don't talk about it. For example, a uh, hundred years ago, women couldn't vote. And you could read in a newspaper, you know, women are good in the house, 
have, we have a big mistake to have, make a board about important things, about wars and things like that. And everybody agreed, except for some people that didn't. And after a few generations of struggle, they got the vote for women. Well, it's important to realize that people don't change. There's still people with chauvinistic opinions. But what, the way people talk about things changes people's behavior. So now you can't say, take away the vote from women, right? That's unthinkable. So we need to think about the way we talk about uh, the, the emotional and subjective process of science, or science itself. And just to give an example, I mean, we need to invent words. We're really good at inventing words, right? Like uh, um, H -DAC I and B -B -RAF. <laughs> And so we should, we should, you know, we shouldn't find it too difficult. So I want to share with you, as I turn this board, a word that was transformational for me as a mentor. Because when I became a PI, you know, after this PhD experience, I also had to start mentoring people walking to the unknown, into the unknown, and of course I didn't have training for that, so I had to try to invent something. And this has to do with the mental schema that we have when we start research. So as human beings, we build, uh, we build a prediction, basically, schema is a prediction for anything we do. If I want to, um, for example, if I want to touch this, this thing here, before I start moving my hand, my brain already plots out the trajectory of all the muscles about a second in advance. And if I'm blocked, my schema doesn't match reality, that's like what's a dissonance that's very alarming. It's not only frustrating, it's like something's wrong with the universe. So our schemas had better be accurate. But guess, what is the schema that we have when we start to do research? So if we believe the way that papers are written, or textbooks are written, or courses are given usually, we might have the following schema. We can say, A is the question, B is the answer, and research is a straight path. <laughs> now, the problem with this schema is if your experiment doesn't work or your student gets depressed, it's considered as something fundamentally wrong with the universe and causes not only frustration, but there's something very toxic about it. So, I teach my students a different schema from day one that I think is more realistic. It goes like this. I say A is the question, B is the answer, and you start going, and then experiments don't work. And then they don't work some more. <laughs> and some more, they continue not working until you reach a point linked with negative emotions where it feels like somebody pulled the rug under your feet, your basic assumptions aren't working, and the name we use for this in my group is the cloud, the cloud of research. So I'm going to draw a cloud here. <laughs> right, the cloud. Okay. Now you can be stuck in the cloud for a time that has a long tail distribution. It could be a week, a month, three months, no problem, six months, a year, two years a PhD thesis, <laughs> a whole career, you die, you re reincarnate as a scientist, you're still in the cloud. But if you have enough support, then sometimes through the cloud you can see a new answer, C, and you decide to go for it. And then experiments don't work, they don't work. <laughs> but you get there. And then you publish a paper, A, arrow, C, which is a good way to communicate very clear, as long as a, commu that as a community we, do we don't forget the way we got from A to C. Now, you know, the cloud is an inherent part of our craft because it kind of stands like a, like a guard, you can say, at the boundary between the land of the known and the land of the unknown. Because in order to discover something it's truly new, at least one of your basic assumptions has to change. Otherwise, it's not new. Yeah? And that's why, as scientists, what we do every day is try to bring ourselves to this boundary between the known and the unknown and face the uncomfortable cloud. That's, our, that's what we do. 
Now, notice I put B in the land of the known. That's our research proposal, our grant proposal. It's very important to have a good B, a good rich B, because without it we wouldn't start moving, right? But C is almost always more interesting, amazing, aesthetic, somebody said aesthetic, right? Opening than B. That's why we go to get it. And I'm very happy to hear about your grant. It, it, it's no strings attached, kind of. That's right. That's a, scientists devising a grant that looks like science. Not every grant is like that. Because B shouldn't be a legal document. Because of this. Um, now, everyone in my group knows this word, the cloud, and very often, I, uh, students come to me and say, Uri, I'm in the cloud. <laughs> and I say, great, you must be feeling miserable. <laughs> but I'm kind of happy because maybe, maybe we're here. Maybe we stand a chance to discover something new. And as a mentor, it focuses me. So instead of ignoring that student and focusing on students that are now more like working, their project is working, or ordering from Sigma a whip and applying some psychological pressure. Exactly. That's not, that doesn't work well because research in psychology shows that when you're feeling fear, uh, your, your ways of thinking are, become conservative. In order to get out of the cloud, you need other kinds of, you need kind of basically, what you need is a playful curiosity that builds on other kinds of emotions, which are solidarity and trust, something like that. And the question is how to, with each particular person you're working with, understand what you can support in order to, um, to meet the, their own way of dealing with the cloud. So when I say this, I can say I'm in, uh, kind of emerging from a mid-career cloud. So how many of you know this cloud feeling of the cloud? You can raise your hand if you want to see if it also happens in EACR. <laughs> and, and Maybe I want to offer you, in order to learn something from this uh, session, to, if you would, to think about something that helps you in the cloud, something that helps you get out of it, or something that helps you get what you need. What is it? And turn to the person sitting next to you and just tell them what your approach is to dealing with the cloud. So please, uh, even if you don't know that person, maybe behind you, introduce yourself, because we're here to meet each other. And, and uh, meet, meet someone and, and say hi, hi. 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 and find hi. out hi. what is it. So, uh, thank you. It's hard to stop you. Uh, so, I'd like to hear what, what strategies work so that we can share. Yeah, thank you. So, reconnect with your original drive. In order to maybe to have resilience. What else works? So you go to talks with somebody from a different field? Did I understand you correctly? So talking to someone, again, we're not in isolation, often helps, helps very much. It could be someone from a different field, just explaining your problem. Sometimes you find a solution inside you. Yeah. So again, science can't be done in isolation. That's one of the reasons. So maybe the primary reason. What else? You never stop. Okay, so you say a combination of two things. One is stubbornness, and the other one is not to uh, be in an illusion that B is the only answer. Just thinking that there is B, C, D, There's F. C1, C2, C3, C4. Yes. You need to move the target. Yes. This frame of mind. What else? Disconnect. So how do you do that, for example? <laughs> Good. So you say, go for a walk, go away, leave it. So I would like to say that, in my opinion, a well-timed vacation is part of the scientific method. <laughs> and you can quote me on that. But, and I also want to say, of course, not for everyone. Some people I've seen, it's actually working at the bench more. It's very, it, I think it, everything that has to do with huma humanity and human process is very individual. But for some people, taking a vacation is the right time. Because the mind is still working on the problem some, in some way, and vacation kind of gives you new metaphors, I would say. It's like Archimedes going to the bath and seeing the water rise. 
you took a bath vacation, right? Like aromatherapy and stuff. So seeing the water rise, and then understand that's how you can measure the volume of the crown. And so we get a different metaphor. That's like, um, okay, so we heard some ways to get out of the cloud. And I think we need a hundred more words like this in general. I'm just saying a hundred to, uh, to make sense for us to talk about the scientific process. And as I said, talking about it makes it actually exist in a cultural way. And then uh, it becomes something people care about. And then, or like forming grants in the right way. In many aspects of our profession, we have many aspects of our profession where our system doesn't align with our values. Have you noticed that? Like our values of trust, gift giving, we publish things. We, if I give you 100,000 euros, I trust you'll do something that you really want to do with it, right? That's very rare, not a big problem. But our systems don't necessarily reflect that. So I want to come to the last part, which is something to do to, to help change the culture at your institution. <laughs> Dear authors, we have now heard from three referees <laughs> whose comments are attached below. As you will see, they've raised concerns about your interpretation of the facts, your choice of model systems, your references, and the style of your prose. Oh yeah, referee number one says the topic is interesting, results are incorrect. Referee number two says the results are correct, but the topic isn't interesting. <laughs> referee number three suggests 14 additional experiments, although tangential to your main point would be nice to have. Oh yeah, as a result we regret that we cannot offer publication at this time. Please know that we value your work and we'd like to see more of it in the future. At the same time, we remain committed to the high standards of the archival journal of upper nasal cavity research. <laughs> Music and therapy. A lot of things are under our control, for example, peer review which I think is in many ways essential and saved me from making a lot of mistakes. But we need to teach, our, teach ourselves how to do it, right? We all know what a good review feels like. It could be highlighting the value of the work and what's new in it and making suggestions to improve that are taking into account the resources or even saying, yeah, for your own good, you better think again. <laughs> But instead, we do a lot of times journal clubs where the idea is to take a dagger and the best scientist is the one who can prove the other scientist wrong. <laughs> Even though we know what a good review is. So it's like a cycle of abuse. So I'm wondering, maybe it's changed. People here, is there now uh, workshops on how to write a review? No. This is like a thousand people here. So less than 0.1% <laughs> p-values. Um, <laughs> but that shouldn't be too hard, right, to establish criteria for reviewing and maybe stop the cycle of abuse. Um, it's very different in different fields, by the way. Okay, so science as a culture, culture can be changed. There's different ways to do it. Many things you could do if you like to, um, to in impact your range of impact. Even if you're a graduate student or a master's student, you can do things. I want to describe one, one way that's uh, been effective all over the world and with different groups, master students, graduate students, PIs, and mid-career PIs, and that is, it started, I mean, one example was at Weizmann, my institute um, hired about 17 new faculty in one year, which was a lot for us, and they were of the new generation, and they said, we want to get some training on how to be a PI. They went to the dean, and the dean did something for the first time ever, brought all the new faculty together to meet each other. So that was already something incredible. And then they invited a management training workshop from industry, which was a total disaster. They said, here is the president, here is the vice president. When you do an experiment, who do you need permission for? The president, the vice president. It was totally off. But they, they still didn't uh, give up. They, they invited Weizmann uh, one of those EMBO lab uh, management courses. Did anybody take those? EMBO? Yeah, you did? You did too? That's all? Raise your hand, I'm just wondering. 
maybe a few percent. And the difference was that they brought him to Israel and all the PIs from the same institute took it together. That was something quite unusual. And they were quite skeptical by this time. But, but, but when they were through with those two days, they, they found that they were the most important two days of their recent career. And they decided to meet next, the next week to talk about what they've learned. And instead of 17 stories, they had time for just one story. Right? I have a student, very talented, but motivation is going down. But it was so relevant for all of them, and they decided to keep meeting. They keep meeting every two weeks. Very busy people, so over lunch. And they formed a peer group. So this peer group. Peer group, it's not a therapy group, nobody gets cured. It's a group of people at the same stage, in the same boat, who have similar issues, so there's solidarity, and you hear what other people deal with, them. maybe you find solutions that might be right for you or not, and that gives hope. So the solidarity and hope part is supplied by these peer groups. They wrote a paper in Molecular Cell about this, in fact, it was so uh, interesting for them. And ev now uh, there's this workshop coming to Weizmann every two years, and every time a new peer group forms. Now there's also a peer group of graduate students in chemistry, female graduate students in physics, foreign students, and mid-career scientists, etc. <coughs> Which people, many people find very, like a, a place to stop and reflect on the, on the time that moves so quickly in our profession, about the process of it. Yeah, and also to, to, to have supportive friends. All those 17 got tenure. How's that? <laughs> so there's something also amazing about the Something about it. So, uh, you're very busy with your lab and the other parts of your life, but I'm wondering how many of you would be interested, in principle, to think about starting a peer group? Would have just raise your hand, I'm just wondering. So, I see about 10%. Mm -hmm. okay. So, just to provide some information, I'd like to ask you to take out your cell phone, if you like, and type in uh, young PI Forum, Young PI Forum. It's not my website, it's a website that Ron Milo and Maya Schuldener set up for their group, Young PI Forum. And there is a lot of information there about how to start a peer group. So, where can I write this so that you can see? What do you think? What do you think? Right. The Young PI Forum. And you find papers there about what to do, what worked, the, the imposter syndrome, a lot of material, fascinating. Um, okay, before I finish, maybe I just want to open up to see if anybody has a comment, something I missed, and you don't want to agree with something or something you want to say. This is the time, so please. So I'll try to repeat to see if I got it. We come into science a lot of us thinking we keep going into academia. At some, some stage, a lot of us leave. Yeah. And we don't address this as a, this very That's huge cool. wave. It was a number here, 90% leave, is that right? That's a huge, I mean, you can't ignore it. It's a, it's a tenfold effect. But when you go into university, you don't get a prospectus with what have our graduates done, right? How many are there? And that's a huge loss of opportunity because you can frame scientific education is a, something that's much bigger than staying in academia. And basically what it is is as follows. All the A, arrow, B problems in the world have been solved by algorithms. They've solved because what's left are these kind of problems. Now if you want someone to solve a problem like that, with a cloud in it, you need somebody who's been trained in a kind of safe environment to go through the cloud. That's to say trained to deal with their own personality in the cloud. And who are they? The scientists. <laughs> now, the, the thing is, a lot of scientists have, you know, some, some stay in academia, a lot of them have interests, passions, they're outside the scope of science. We can, when we frame graduate school education like this, we're actually training people to go into the unknown. And that is a, that's a huge gift to society, as long as we don't, they don't end up, with, go out of academia wounded in need of healing, right? So I fully support, when we reframe like that, we can immediately think how to restructure graduate school education to take into account 
other options for productive things to do, yeah? In any field, of, you know, 21st century, there's not a, a shortage of cloud-like problems. You know, PI. So if I understand correctly, you're talking about a selection bias or selection pressure for who stays in science. And the way you said it was that as a student, you train to focus on one problem and keep going at it, etc. But you need maybe different skills to be a PI. Uh, you have to go through the bottleneck of a job talk, for example. You know. And who are we selecting to stay? Who can stand it, actually, and stay in science if we keep the culture like it is right now? It's kind of a selection bias, I think. I think that, um, again, this is something we can deal with by, first of all, having a discussion about the different ways that scientists do science. There's in very large diversity of ways to get from A to C, and, um, and pe so, so people can find not a one way to do science, but like a, a rich picture of what it means to be a scientist. It's much more diverse than just this, uh, what you said, which, which was a kind of, I don't know how to call it, like a very one-dimensional situation. For example, for me, and for I think many other scientists, adding to our identity something like a change agent, which means I, I devote a little bit of my time to choosing a topic to change the culture of science is something that widens your scope. And even as a graduate student, a master's student, a postdoc, you have some influence over the people around you, for instance, by forming a peer group or whatever it is. There was a peer group of postdocs at Weizmann that made up uh, an like a little uh, custom. When a new foreign postdoc arrived at Weizmann, one of them goes to the airport to pick them up. It's a small thing, but very meaningful for the orientation, and the, because they remember what it's like to come to a new country. So. You can um, develop additional sides of what it means to be a scientist, which are exactly on this emotional, subjective realm. The systems maybe aren't ready right now, but keep going, they will be. Um, okay, so we'll finish. Uh, what would you like me to sing about? What's the last song? <laughs> Something positive. <laughs> yeah, what? What else? Huh? Administration. Okay. No. <laughs> administration. About doing administrative work or administration. Yeah. What? How to writing? Writing. Okay. Referee number two. Referee number two. Okay, so we have referee number two. Something positive. Administration. In writing? I'm happy to inform that. I'm happy to inform that. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> when I get a paper to review, I look for what is fresh and new, and how to realize its full potential. The science is a social affair.
Positive? <laughs> Hallelujah, I'll review ya. Hallelujah, I'll review ya. Thank you very much. I'll be here. Everybody wants more information on peer group, and I hope you enjoyed this conference very much. It ended up with your goal of coming here fulfilled, and uh, that science culture will become more balanced with the subjective, emotional, and rational and objective.